what is happening everybody i hope your week is uh is getting ready to wrap up in a powerful positive way or at least in a creative constructive way i think we put a little too much pressure on ourselves to to be positive we don't need to be positive just need to be creative just need to be constructive just need to do uh the best that we can to live uh in a, in a healthy way in a way that moves us forward welcome to thursday so uh i'm, I'm experimenting here with uh, a new little thing that I wanna do a couple of days a week called TK's Two Cents. And I want to, to do a more interactive and um, perhaps uh, performative approach to tweeting. You know, all of us are out there tweeting every day, writing down our different thoughts. And so what I wanna do is I wanna take a couple of my tweets from the past, particularly ones that, have made, that may have gotten uh, the highest engagement or ones that might be interesting to me or ones that I've gotten a lot of questions about. And I wanna focus on one to two tweets at a time. And I wanna provide a little context for that tweet. I wanna share what was going on at the time I wrote that. What observations uh, were I making about the world that made me feel like this is something that needs to be said? Or maybe what's my response to some of the challenges and questions that people have expressed? Or maybe what are my tips on how you can put something like what I'm talking about into practical application? Um, we only have what, like 140 characters on Twitter, and, and there's always more to be said than what we write in that space. And this is an opportunity for me to say it. And, and for those of you who might find value in it, um, engage me, talk to me, feel free to, uh, to, to share your thoughts and so forth. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. And, and, and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I, I want this to be less than 30 minutes. If I can get it down to 15, all the better. Um, I want this to be something that's sustainable, feels easy and fun to do, and, and, and I can keep, keep bringing it to you every week. So I want to start with the first tweet. I'm going to do two today. And here's the first one. I wrote, moods don't equal morals. Emotions don't equal ethics. Indignation does not equal integrity. It's possible to have righteous feelings, but destructive responses. Let's not condemn our feelings. Let's turn them into fuel for good. I had a great conversation with uh, my brother BJ Thompson, BJ Thompson, the founder of A Better Us. And uh, if you don't know BJ, uh, definitely go check him out on Twitter. Uh, very insightful guy, but very heartfelt, compassionate guy who's doing a lot of good to help people as a coach and as an activist alike. Um, in his profession and in his personal life, the brother is real through and through. And I really enjoyed my talk with him. But when we were talking, one of the things we talked about is how anger and frustration is something that you can use to let yourself off the hook. At the end of the day, morality and integrity and virtue, it's about what you actually do. And it's not just about what you feel. And if you get too comfortable being the kind of person who has the right emotional response to a problem, you can deprive yourself of that unique joy and sense of purpose that comes from being more than a feeling, from bringing more than an emotion to your circumstances and challenges in life. You can be the kind of person who takes responsibility for doing something about the things that you see. So one example that BJ shared was someone, a black woman who went to a hospital and was very upset about the treatment that she received. And so she was so upset about that, she went and raised resources and built another hospital so that she could be, so that not only her, but other people could be treated according with the principles that govern her moral views. And that was just one example, one of many types of examples of how you can take anger and you can turn it into a constructive force. Now, I want to be clear on what that does not mean. It can be very easy to hear people talk about this sort of thing and hear that as a condemnation of feeling, telling you, you should feel bad if you're angry about things that are worth getting angry about. And you shouldn't. You should never feel bad about feeling bad. I think about the words of my man, Bobby McFerrin, don't worry, be happy. He says, in every life we have some trouble, but when you worry, you make it double. So don't double your troubles by condemning yourself or beating yourself up for whatever feeling that you have, whether it's sadness, jealousy, anger, frustration, your feelings are your feelings. It's not about trying to suppress them. It's about harnessing those feelings as a force for good and asking yourself, how can I use this emotional energy 
to make decisions that's going to move me forward and the people around me forward in a healthy, life-giving way. So it's not about condemning your emotions. The second thing that this is not about, this is not about saying you've got to do something as big as build a hospital. A lot of the problems that we get angry at in life, they're bigger than us. A lot of these problems are large scale problems. And most of us are never going to do something like, hey, raise enough money to build an entire hospital. But it doesn't need to be that big in order to make a difference. It's not about comparing your actions to other people's actions so that you can feel more righteous than them. It's about saying, you know, if I'm angry about it, I'm not going to condemn myself for that feeling, but I'm going to ask myself, what's one thing I can do to express that anger in a way that's creative and constructive? And if I can't come up with an easy answer for that, that's cool. I'm not going to condemn myself for not having an answer to that, but I'm going to challenge myself with that question daily so that I can develop competency in the arena of being able to provide a satisfactory answer to it. I'll, I'll tell you one moment that I had. I remember when I was working on my first startup, this was back in the day, I, I, I was simultaneously working at a restaurant to pay my bills, keep things afloat. And I was putting in like 12 hours a day. And I would work on my startup as a side hustle late at night. And there was this Denny's in my neighborhood that I would go to because uh, that was the late place I could be. I pop open my laptop and I would just go to work on my stuff. And I'm usually in there, you know, like two, three in the morning, drinking coffee, um, working on my stuff. And it's usually pretty quiet on the weeknights when I'm doing this. It gets really crazy in the, on the weekends with all the partiers and clubbers, but weeknights was pretty chill. And I remember these four guys came in. It was about four of them, young black dudes. And they were like, like they were like high school age. And they sit down, they talk with each other, they laugh and they're joking and they have their meal. And then when it's time for them to leave, they try to pay and they seem to be up there for an inordinate amount of time. I'm like, hmm, this is interesting. I don't know what's going on. And the person that's working tells them, my credit card machine has broken. I'm not able to take your payment. Do you guys have cash? And the guys were like, no, we don't have cash. And she says, yeah, this credit card's broken. I'm going to have to see if I can fix it, what I can do, whatever. And she takes about 15 minutes to, to resolve the problem and still has not resolved it. And you can see these guys, you know, being kind of like whiny about it, you know, just kind of being teenagers about it. Like, oh man, I'm ready to go home and she can't take our payments. And for whatever reason, I just got really annoyed by this. I just felt like this entire situation was unfair. And, but I was like, I'm just going to mind my business and I, and I keep working. But, but then I, I get annoyed to the point where I just can't shut up about it. And I, and I say to the person who's working there, I say, excuse me, I know this is not my situation. It's you doing, dealing with these guys, but I've been watching this for like the last 20 minutes at least. And it looks to me like your inability to accept payment from them is not their fault. And yet they're paying the price for that problem with their own time and energy. It seems to me that this is a cost that Denny's should eat. You know, um, I understand that you have this situation. It's not your fault individually. It's a terrible situation to be in, but I don't think your customers should have to pay for it. I think you should let these guys go. And then, you know, you figure that out in your own time, in your own time. And I, I didn't know what she was going to say to me. She looked at me and she said, you know what? You're right. That's only fair. And then she told the guy, she said, you guys can go. And they were like, oh, man, thank you so much, sir. And that felt so good. You know, it's a moment that I didn't even plan. It wasn't part of my life mission statement. My life mission statement wasn't to be the defenders of justice at Denny's. I didn't go in there planning on that. That's not my passion to do that. That's the only time that's ever happened with me in a restaurant. In fact, being a former server, I absolutely hate to be confrontational in a restaurant. That was the only time. But it was a moment where I felt anger and I challenged myself with that question, TK. What can you do with that anger to harness it as a force for good? And that's the question that I, that I want people to think about, um, you know, a, a, as they read that tweet. Use your anger for good. Don't condemn yourself for what you feel, but also don't let yourself off the hook. Don't, don't confuse your, your outrage or your indignation with being virtuous, being a person of integrity. And on social media today, it's easier than ever for us to, you know, for the, for the low, low cost of, of two seconds and two sentences, 
to announce to the world that we're outraged about something. And if you are outraged, I got no problem with that, but let's push ourselves to be better. Let's push ourselves to go further because um, we, we have a lot that we can offer the world and I don't want you to underestimate what that means for you. All right, let's go to my, my second tweet. This was an interesting one because, uh, you know, th this one sparked a little controversy. Uh, let me read it first. Looting is wrong and blaming the wrong people for looting is wrong and using the wrongness of looting to drown out discussions about what preceded the looting is wrong and reducing discussions about race and riots to the same old left versus right talking points is wrong. It's funny because I thought when I wrote this that this was something that everybody could agree with. And that's not why I wrote it, by the way. I don't, I don't choose what I write based on me thinking, oh, everyone's going to agree with this. I'm not afraid of disagreement. I'm not afraid for anybody to be uncomfortable by what I write. I write from a place of authenticity. But when, when I wrote that, I thought, man, you know what? That captures something I've been feeling underneath for a while. And I think a lot of people would resonate with that. You know, some, some people are only focusing on, on one aspect of things, right? That they're not talking about anything other than the looters. And some people, they're not talking about anything other than the wrongs being done by, their, by somebody else's group or whatever it may be. And I, I felt like there was a lot of excuse making. And I just wanted to cut through that and say, hey, it's all wrong. It's all wrong, okay? And our fight is against evil, point blank, period. And it was funny because um, this tweet was similar to one that I wrote um, where I said, Jesus is not a member of your political party. And I got so many responses where people would say things like, yeah, but Republicans got more Christians than Democrats. Yeah, but this and that, and this and that. Yeah, but this and that. And I'm like, man, where are all these yeah and buts coming from? But it captures the importance of this last statement and why so many people heard something in the tweet that goes beyond the easy to understand common sense messages that are right in front of your eyes. And it's that last sentence. We are so conditioned to reduce every discussion about the kinds of things like we're observing in our world today to, to conventional talking points about left and right. It's as if we don't listen to what people actually say but we listen to the political party. We think they're representing when they say it. And we react to that. We, we react to what we think is their political party affiliation or their political agenda. And the reason I, I caution against this, it's out of no desire to be politically correct. I'm neither left nor right. You know, I'm, I'm pretty forthcoming about my political stance. I'm a voluntarist. Um, I believe that the real battle is not between left and right. I believe that the real battle is between force and freedom. The real battle is between coercion and creativity. The real battle is between violence and voluntariness. That's the real battle. And I'm willing to work together with anybody who is on the side of voluntariness, who is on the side of freedom, who is on the side of creativity over those other forces of coercion and violence and force. I don't care what label you wear. I'm not trying to convert anybody to a label, but I don't identify with either the left or the right in that regard. So I didn't make this statement in order to be politically correct. I made this statement because I want to challenge people to be more self-interested in their desire to learn. When you look at everything in terms of left and right, it makes it extremely difficult to learn from people that you look at as the other. You know, if you can't learn from people that you don't like, you can't learn at all. If you can't learn from people that you don't disagree with, you can't learn at all because there is no perfect source of knowledge in the human world. We all have our flaws. We all have our shortcomings. Even people that are in the same political group as you, even people who identify as voluntarists and believe what I believe, there are aspects of their thinking and of their lives that I want to disassociate myself from. No organization, no party, no point on the political spectrum is free of people who have fallen short of the glory of God. You know, everybody out there has their flaws and failings. And the only way that we find uncommon solutions is if we have uncommon conversations. And the only way that we have uncommon conversations is if we go beyond our conventional, easy, familiar, safe space talking points 
and we talk to people who think differently. We even talk to other people who don't identify with that left and right spectrum. In fact, there are a lot of people that were busy mocking and condemning who don't even vote, who have some very interesting things to say. And the reason why they don't vote is because they lack trust in the existing and popular options. And if we listen to those people, we might learn something. We might be able to think in a new direction. And even if you don't change your political beliefs, you might have a new way of articulating the very best things that can be said for your position if you understand something new about the people who don't think like you. So, you know, going beyond the left versus right thinking isn't about pretending like that battle doesn't exist, but it's about recognizing that there are more battles than that. And that battle is only a manifestation of a much bigger, broader battle. Moral reasoning is a much more fundamental category than political reasoning. Political reasoning must fit inside of that more fundamental category, but it is moral reasoning. And we have to start not by asking, is that the liberal position? Is that the conservative position? Start by asking, is that true? What is useful? What is good in what this person has said? And how might I use that in order to help create, or create a better world? And no, I don't have to pretend that our disagreements are not also real. You can disagree and you can learn at the same time. It's all possible. You know, so, um, you know, I, I think about in that movie Hunger Games, there's a moment where I, I forget the names of the characters, but, you know, two people are getting really mad at each other and they're about to get into a fight. And one of the characters says, hey, hey, remember who the real enemy is. Remember who the real enemy is, you know, because they were all working together to fight against a common enemy. And that enemy was the state. That enemy was a, a, a system of violence that oppressed all of them, all the people from the different districts, the people that were polar opposites, the people that were of different races, the people that hated each other and were at each other's throats. They were all oppressed just in different ways by a single system. And it was so easy for them to get distracted by their battles with each other that they forgot, like, wait a minute, we can work out our petty little differences later, but these arguments we're having, some of them are blinding us to the fact that there's a real enemy, an enemy of coercion, an enemy of violence that doesn't care about any of us and let's remember who that is. So we can still fight with each other. We can still debate with each other. We can still disagree with each other. We can still get mad at each other. That's only human. But as we're doing all that, let's not forget who the real enemy is. Hey, I'm out. I said this thing would be short. Those are my two tweets for the day. Those are TK's two cents. Holler at me in the comments. It's been real, y'all. I'll see y'all again next week. Cheers.